Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your patience and holding. We now have your speakers in conference. Please be aware each of your lines is in a listen-only mode. At the conclusion of today's presentation, we will open the floor for questions. At that time, instructions will be given as to the procedure to follow if you would like to ask a question. You may also ask questions via the chat pod located to the right-hand side of your screen. Above that, you'll see the resources pod with some materials that you can download. It is now my pleasure to turn today's conference over to Jenny Situ. Ma'am, you may begin. Hi, everyone. I am Jenny Situ from the American Hospital Association. Thank you so much for joining us today for today's webinar titled Human Trafficking 102, Victim-Centered and Trauma-Informed Care. This is brought to you by the AHA's Hospital Against Violence Campaign, also known as the HAVE Campaign. These webinars are part of the AHA's efforts to increase awareness of violence in hospitals and communities and engage hospitals and health systems in violence prevention. The HAVE campaign will focus on three areas of violence prevention, workforce violence in hospitals, community violence, and human trafficking. The HAVE framework has three elements, a website of resources for hospitals, educational offerings such as this webinar, and finally research quantifying the cost of violence in hospitals. In 2018, AHA will invite hospitals to participate in a Have Hope Day of Awareness, a national campaign devoted to violence prevention. Details will be forthcoming, so please stay tuned. To present today's session, we are pleased to have with us Holly Austin Gibbs, who leads Dignity Health's Human Trafficking Response Program, and Annika Huff, subject matter expert. Uh, with that, I will turn the call over to Holly. Ms. Gibbs, please begin. Uh, thanks, Jenny. This is Holly Gibbs. I am the Human Trafficking Response Program Director at Dignity Health. I am so glad to be a part of this webinar series. This is the second session of a three-part webinar series addressing human trafficking. In the first um, webinar, we covered Human Trafficking 101, which is, uh, covers definitions, prevalence, indicators, and uh, it was also an opportunity for me to share a little bit about my personal story as a survivor of child sex trafficking. And I was able to share more about our program at Dignity Health, which was launched in 2014 uh, by a um, uh, partnership between Mission Integration and Patient Care Services. So with that, I'm going to um, uh, introduce my, my co-presenter for today's um, webinar. This is Annika Huff. You can see Annika here. Annika is a survivor of sex trafficking and homelessness as a teenager. In 2016, Annika testified against her trafficker in Las Vegas, Nevada. He was convicted on 15 felony counts and was sentenced to life without the possibility of parole. Annika has overcome many obstacles and has risen above them. Today, she speaks publicly to educate the community on human trafficking, and she also mentors other survivors. Annika has offered training to various organizations, hospitals, tattoo shops, and hotels about how to recognize and respond to human trafficking. Her story is also featured in a documentary, and she's one of 12 survivors on a, uh, a community, uh, on an, um, an organization in, um, in California, it's called the CSEC Action Team and the CSEC Advisory Board for the state of California. And this, this group is um, focused on combating child sex trafficking in California. So we're really lucky to have her on today's call. Annika, thank you again for joining us. So uh, our objectives for today's webinar are to uh, provide a victim-centered approach to patient care and client services. Um, so this is providing a, a victim-centered approach to any person who's been identified as a potential victim. This is the kind of approach that you want to implement. And then to incorporate trauma-informed practices into normal patient care and client services. 
And, and uh, this is, um, these are practices that are implemented at Dignity Health as part of our initiative to educate staff on how to identify signs and symptoms of human trafficking and then how to respond appropriately. Um, I want to mention uh, in the resources section above, you can download the presentation for Human Trafficking 101 and the pre presentation for today's webinar. And there are going to be recordings available on AHA's uh, website. So provide a victim-centered approach. Why is this uh, approach so important? Um, the Office for Victims of Crime defines a victim-centered approach as uh, prioritizing a person's wishes, safety, and well-being. So this means we are seeking and maximizing input from a, from a patient uh, on what they need, on what they want, and what is safest for them. We're including them in that conversation. And this is especially important for victims of human trafficking because they've just been through an experience where another person took away their personal agency. Um, for victims of sex and labor trafficking, it's often the case that an employer or um, someone else uh, in the role of a trafficker is choosing what this person is going to do for work, when they're going to work, what they're going to wear, where they're going to sleep, when they're going to sleep, um, if they're even going to eat. And so by focusing on the needs and concerns of our patient, we can ensure that this person feels safe and empowered. That's how we can begin to break the chains um, from their human trafficking victimization. With that, I'm going to hand it off to Annika to share a little bit about her story and um, some examples of uh, patient care. <clears throat> I was born in Denver, Colorado. I had a single teen mom growing up. My father was very absent in my childhood. He uh, lived in Hawaii, so he was an ocean away from me. He was very um, emotionally disconnected and he was an alcoholic. My mom was very emotionally abusive and very uh, neglectful. There was some physical abuse and there was also sexual abuse from other uh, people in my uh, life during childhood. My mom often uh, shipped me off to different family members' houses during uh, my childhood to um, get times where she had a break, um, so she wouldn't have to take care of me. At 16, she uh, gave guardianship over to my aunt in California, and this was um, her kicking me out for the very last time. When she gave guardianship over to my aunt in California, I started a cycle um, for about two years where I um, was moving to places and not wanting to be around my family because my family was so um, dysfunctional that I would uh, look for people in the community to try and get away. And in some places I was lucky, I found um, safer places to be, and in other places I was not so lucky, and I found uh, very unhealthy places to be. For two years, I did this. Um, I was in between Colorado, California, and Nevada. I lived in Denver and all parts of California, including um, the Valley, Stockton, California, um, San Francisco area. Um, Oceanside, California, and then Las Vegas, Nevada. When I was 17, it was my final stop. I was moving in with my dad, which is the last place I wanted to be. It was a couple months before my 18th birthday. I was moving in with him to a uh, weekly, and a weekly is pretty unique to Las Vegas. Uh, you can pay by the night, you can pay by the week, or you can pay by the month. Weeklies have a tendency to attract really um, unhealthy and bad people because of the fact that you can pay by the night. So I saw a lot of really bad things. And when I went to reach out for, for people in the community, I did not reach out for the right people. I was targeted by um, multiple traffickers. Um, luckily, I was only uh, 
actually under the control of one. I was really disconnected to my family at this point. I had just um, turned 18 three weeks before that. And um, my family there, I had an aunt and uncle that lived in Las Vegas as well. And they were kicking me out of their house. And I did not want to move back in with my father. So my friend in Ohio offered to uh, let me move in with them. And this, for me, was like um, a golden ticket, an opportunity to have a, uh, a good life. I thought I uh, could get a, a, a career started and, and go back to, to getting into school and, and things of that nature. When I was um, planning this, I was planning to never speak to my family again. I went to visit my dad for uh, the very last time. It was the night before I was supposed to leave on this Greyhound bus. I went to visit him, and I went back to the Greyhound bus, to the bus station, sorry, to uh, go back home that night. When I got to the bus, there was a car that pulled up. There was a young girl and a young guy, and the young girl looked younger than me. She was uh, well-dressed, and he was well-dressed, and she asked me if I wanted to come party. It wasn't the first time I got into a stranger's car but it was the last. That night seemed relatively normal. They never, um, they never seemed like they had ill intentions for me. And we just hung out at their house, we watched movies, and we drank a little bit. I told them about my Greyhound bus t ticket the next day, and they offered to drive me there, and that I would be able to uh, get a little bit of sleep, because at this point, it was about 2, two o'clock in the morning. This sounded really nice because it was going to take hours for me to, to get on the local buses to get to the Greyhound station. So I went and got my stuff, and I went back to their house. I took my nap, and when I woke up from my nap, he was gone. I was frantic. The girl was in the house, but he was gone. She said that he was around the corner grabbing gas, and she stalled for about an hour until he walked in the door. It was four minutes before my Greyhound bus was supposed to leave. I frantically put my bag in his car, and as the bus was supposed to leave, I said, stop, stop, we missed my bus. At this point in time, it was never a thought in my mind to go back to my family's house. I thought of things like shelters, and if I got a job today, would I have made enough money in two weeks to get my own apartment? He was giving me a feel as I was trying to think of a plan. If I worked for him for two weeks, he would give me $500 to leave with, enough to pay my Greyhound bus ticket, and $100 to leave with so I could pay for food. I would have a place to stay, food to eat. I looked very blankly at him, and I said, it looks like you made me have to. That night I was trafficked for the very first time. My trafficker was a gorilla pimp. A gorilla pimp is a trafficker who uses fear, violence, and threats to keep their girl in line. When I was being trafficked, the violence was very, very severe. It started off being less severe. It started off as just a beating on the butt with a belt. By the time I left, I was being forced to play Russia roulette, being uh, being pistol whipped on the back of the head, being forced to uh, be waterboarded, being forced to stay in tubs of, bathtubs of ice uh, four or five hours. I was not allowed to shower in the house. I had to hose off in the backyard. I was not allowed to go in, to the bathroom in the house. I was not allowed to sleep in the house. I had gotten so sick that my trafficker knew I was dying. He had given me gangrene infection from a beating with a metal pole. He let me walk around with it for two weeks. So he sold me to another trafficker. This other trafficker did not know the condition I was in. So my, this other trafficker said, please come pick her up. I did not pay for a dead body. My trafficker came and picked me up. And he got me in the car, and he said, why should I take you to the hospital instead of the desert? 
I convinced him to take me to the hospital instead of the desert because I said I was still working with the trafficker. I walked a mile to the hospital because he didn't want to drop me off at the hospital. And when I went into the emergency department, my experience with the triage nurse was unfortunately pretty negative. And I'll go into that a little bit later, because that's a, a great example of trauma-informed care. I have many examples during my hospitalization because I was hospitalized for so long. I had 28 broken bones. I had lacerations to my liver, my kidney, my spleen. I had gangrene infection on my butt that was three hours away from my bloodstream. I had gangrene infection on my left hand that had to be amputated. And I was 93 pounds because I wasn't allowed to eat very often. During my hospitalization, I was also transferred halfway through it for my safety. I spent two weeks of my hospitalization in Las Vegas, Nevada, and two weeks of my hospitalization in, in California. During my hospitalization in Las Vegas, I had a great social worker. The social worker, when I called her in the room, my family was coming in from California. We didn't have a lot of money growing up, so I knew what my California family was coming out and had nowhere to stay. When I called the social worker in, it wasn't for anything for me. It was for making sure that my family had a place to stay when they got into town. My social worker knew that that was my concern, and they made sure that they got that done as quickly as possible. This is an example of victim-centered care. The nurses never asked me whether or not I was trafficked. They kept making sure that my care was their main focus. They never wanted to poke and pod, prod at the fact that what had happened, even though they can clearly see that I was assaulted in some way. That made me feel that I could open up to them slightly. <clears throat> when I was in the hospital and I first got there, I was um, put in the emergency room for five hours. Really, those five hours were just for prepping me to surgery. I was then put into the ICU. At the ICU, I was introduced by so many nurses. When all the nurses left, I was in the room with just my nurse. She asked me if I had any family in town. I said that my father was in town, and she asked me his, his name. I said his name, but I kind of said it in a way where I was a little confused of why she asked. She walked away towards the door, and I said, why? She goes, because I'll contact him for you. I instantly got very aggressive with her. I said, I know my rights. You will not contact my father. I am 18 years old, and I will sue this hospital. She refrained. She said she was sorry, and she made sure that what I wanted was her main priority. Once my family was present, the surgeons were only contacting my family about what was going on with my care. I had to get hand surgery because of the gangrene infection. When I was getting my hand surgery, my aunt was actually the person that had last had guardianship of me. So she was the one that was being asked about my hand surgery. At first, my aunt came into the room saying, you can get a plastic finger on your hand. And I said, I don't want a plastic finger on my hand. She went and told the doctors. And, and right before I went into surgery, an hour beforehand, the surgeon comes in and says, I heard that you want to get your knuckle taken out and your hands used together. And I said, where did you hear that? He said, your aunt told me that you would like that done. And I said, I've never even heard of the knuckle and hand being fused together. I don't want that done. I am so thankful that that hand surgeon came into that room before I went into surgery. Otherwise, my hand would look different than what I would want it to look like. My family should have never been the ones that had 
the medical say in my case because of the fact that I was over 18. I had a great psychiatrist. She was my rock. My family was unfortunately still the same family that I had before my trafficking. I still was very much trying to take care of them and was a mediator between them. There was, there was fights between them that I mediated. There was crying on my shoulders. All while I was trying to physically be healthy or trying to get healthier. My psychiatrist was my rock. I wanted to only talk about how crazy my family was making me feel. She never pushed me to talk about my trafficker. She never wanted to force me to make me feel like I had to. That's an example of victim-centered care. There was an attending physician who asked if it was okay if there were students in the room because of the fact that this was a, um, a hospital that had um, a, a students that were there learning. During this time, there was I was um, very scared to say no or when he came in the room because there was 12 students right behind him. They were all, all of their eyes were looking at me and I felt like I couldn't say no. What they were looking at was actually my skin graft, which was on my butt. So I was very triggered as they all looked at my butt. That last week of my hospitalization, like I said, I was spent um, multiple, multiple two weeks in one hospital and two weeks in another. The second hospital, I was able to choose what I wanted to eat for food. During the first week, I really don't think I um, utilized the being able to choose what I wanted to eat. During the second week, I had gotten a stomach bug in the hospital, and I did utilize what I wanted to eat. At the smell of things, I would puke. I was so sick. But every single meal, I would ask for chicken nuggets. And when the chicken nuggets would come to the room, I would smell them, and sometimes they would make me barf. And it didn't matter how many nurses, how many doctors, or how many family members said, do you want to try and order something other than chicken nuggets? No, I wanted chicken nuggets. But for me, that was the first time in five months that I got to choose something I wanted to eat. And so it was very powerful for me. I'll share the rest of my story and after getting out of trafficking, once we share the trauma-informed care. Back to you, Holly. Thanks, Annika. Sorry, I was on mute. Um, uh, so I can't, I can't stress enough the importance of maximizing, seeking and maximizing the wishes and safety and the well-being uh, um, uh, of your patient. That's victim-centered care. You're, you're making this person feel um, as though they are an active participant in their care and in the choices um, as to uh, what's happening to them and what's happening around them. So this includes any decisions to contact law enforcement. Um, um, I, I think that a lot of times we think that we assume to know what's best for, for a person who may be a victim of any kind of interpersonal violence. Um, but but the, the key to a victim-centered approach is to trust in your patient, to trust in this person to, to also know what's, what's best for them. Um, a, a victim may be fearful of disclosing to law enforcement for many reasons, including um, uh, uh, fear of retaliation by the trafficker. So a victim-centered approach is something that I advocate not just for victims of human trafficking, but for victims of any form of violence, right? And that would include domestic violence. So we know that leaving an abusive partner is the most dangerous time for victims of domestic violence. So we want to um, uh, uh, trust in their um, 
and what they're saying about whether or not it's safe to leave at that time, to, to disclose to law enforcement, and so on. Uh, but we are mandated reporters, right? So there are situations when we have to contact law enforcement and disclose uh, protected health information with or without the person's permission. So number one, it's important to explain limits of confidentiality if you're having a sensitive, if you plan on having a sensitive discussion with a patient, which I recommend if you suspect this person is a victim of any form of violence. Um, but it's important to um, explain your status as a mandated reporter, explain what that means, and then um, ask if they understand, is it okay to move forward with this conversation? But you don't want to explain limits of confidentiality in a way where you're uh, discouraging the person from disclosing. And if it is the case that you have to contact authorities, whether it's CPS, APS, or law enforcement, against your patient's wishes, then the key to providing a victim-centered approach is to continue to advocate on behalf of that person's needs and concerns with authorities. I think a, a lot of times we, we, we may, you know, in, in, especially in a hospital setting, you're super busy. Um, uh, there's a million things going on, and sometimes we think, well, I've contacted law enforcement, so I've gotten this person help. I've done, I've done what I needed to do. In Annika's case, she can share with you um, that, that law enforcement was contacted um, and that the initial encounter with law enforcement for her was really negative, and it took her a long time to trust and open up to law enforcement and um, get to a point where she would agree to testify against her trafficker. But in the meantime, Healthcare staff responded to Annika's needs and concerns, uh, like what, um, how, what, uh, what she was concerned about with her family. That's just one example, a great example. Um, so disclosures must comply with and be limited by requirements of HIPAA and other laws. Um, so if you are required to contact authorities against your patient's wishes, um, we want to make sure that we're, we're sharing only what we need to share, what's required by law. And another thing is a key to be able, being able to provide a victim-centered approach is to know what are your requirements? What are your state requirements? When do you have to contact CPS, APS, and especially law enforcement against your patient's wishes? Um, once you know that, all the boundaries around that, you can explain that to your patient. Um, a suspicion of abuse against an adult may not be sufficient to require a report against their wishes. Uh, so it completely depends on your state's laws, but if a person walks in and you suspect that they're a victim of domestic violence, that may not be enough to contact law enforcement. There may need to be a requirement of a um, wound or a physical injury. Regardless of the requirements to contact authorities, you want to stay focused on the needs and concerns of your patient. Again, don't assume that law enforcement knows how to respond to this person in a way where the person feels safe enough to accept resources, where they feel safe enough to even have a conversation about what resources are available to them. So the goal is not to rescue or gain a disclosure. Um, when you're walking into um, a room to talk to a, a, a patient that you feel may be a victim of any form of interpersonal violence. I would say that the goal should not be to rescue or to gain a disclosure because there's so many reasons why a person may not disclose at that moment, whether they recognize or don't recognize that they're a victim of a crime or some kind of violence. They may be trauma bonded to their, um, to their abuser, and we'll get into what that means uh, a, a little later. Um, for uh, um, children and um, uh, vulnerable adults, they may feel protective towards their family members that are abusive. Um, so, so a disclosure really may not be the reality. So at Dignity Health, we're promoting that um, staff create a safe and non-judgmental space to build rapport with this person, to educate this person about various forms of interpersonal violence, um, like in Annika's case, uh, it would have been good to um, educate Annika about 
what human trafficking means, what sex trafficking means, and maybe doing it in a way that normalizes sharing of the information so she's not feeling singled out. Um, sharing information about domestic violence and sex trafficking. And we can't all be experts on these topics overnight, so I encourage you to reach out for resources on how to share this information with the patient in a way that makes your staff comfortable and the patient comfortable. At Dignity Health, we have actually um, developed a tool uh, to help uh, a, a staff member walk into a room and follow um, some key steps to having this conversation with the patient using some materials. And we're also looking to develop um, brochures and other materials that are survivor-informed, using survivor-informed language and imagery. Um, so please keep an, an eye on our uh, webpage about this program to access those resources. So you want to educate them about interpersonal violence, educate them about their rights and resources, which, which would be um, uh, easiest if you're using that material um, or brochure or some kind of handout uh, to talk about rights and resources, and then to offer assistance. Um, um, and an example would be, you know, um, would you like to talk to someone um, if the person is showing indicators of victimization, as in, in Annika's case, she had um, an overwhelming number of indicators of, of victimization. You could say, I'm worried about um, the risk factors and indicators. Would you like to talk to a victim advocate? And then it's, then it's up to the patient. Uh, we're, we're empowering them to say yes or no. And we want to respect the patient's decision. Uh, we know with domestic violence that victims may need several offers of assistance before accepting help. The same would be true in other forms of violence. So our goal at Dignity Health is to create an experience in which this person would feel welcomed back at a later time um, and to uh, offer compassion and respect regardless of the decision to accept help. And, and this approach works. We have had cases at Dignity Health where patients have come back for resources after re receiving compassion and compassionate care and um, education on what may be available to them. We had one case where um, a patient returned on the, her third visit. Uh, she came back asking for help. So don't be discouraged. You are making a difference. Um, this is a quote from Wendy Barnes, author of Anne's Life Continues. Wendy is also a survivor of sex trafficking. She published a memoir called um, Anne's Life Continues. And Wendy is also with our program uh, at Dignity Health. Wendy writes, hearing a question as simple as are you okay was and is powerful. It plants a seed of dignity. For me, it planted a counter narrative to what my abuser was saying all along that nobody in the world cared about me. A victimized person may not respond at that moment, but each respectful, caring encounter encourages that planted seed to grow, which in turn creates a foundation for personal strength and hope. We also use a, uh, a hotline card at Dignity Health. It's called a shoe card, which I don't like that name because I think um, a lot of people misinterpret that to, to mean that you're supposed to slip this card into the person's shoe without them knowing it, and that's not at all the case. I can't emphasize enough that if we're going to offer resources to uh, patients, we have to let them know. We have to um, uh, leave it up to them whether it's safe for them to take the resource. But we have this shoe card. It's available from the Blue Campaign, which is a, uh, an initiative from, the, from Homeland Security. They have um, all kinds of resources that you can download and purchase. These are um, business card sized plastic cards that can be broken down into three smaller sizes. And they have the National Human Trafficking Hotline on the card, which is available 24-7. Um, the hotline specialists speak both English and Spanish, and they have access to over 200 additional languages. But there's all these other crisis hotlines that we can offer as well. Um, again, perhaps to avoid singling this person out or um, to, to promote normalizing of the sharing of the information, um, you may want to offer a couple of resources like one um, resource for the domestic violence hotline, one for human trafficking, maybe one for sexual assault. Document signs and symptoms. So 
we want to take detailed notes of uh, the patient's statements and the and the patient's conditions. Now, this is this is a little bit of a gray area because there there's a lot of conversation about there out there about pros and cons related to whether or not it's helpful to document what this person is saying because. Um, what is in this person's medical record could potentially be used against them um, in, a, in a court of law. So if the person is remembering the timeline out of order during the a medical encounter, or if, if they get details wrong, or, or if they're being evasive, all of these things could potentially work against the victim. And that's something to keep in mind when taking notes. Um, we've learned a lot at Dignity Health about, um, about what to document. Uh, but it is it is another um, safety net. So this is the way I like to describe it. Mandatory reporting is a safety net. Mandatory reporting is in place to protect a person who is in a position that they can't protect themselves. So of course, mandatory rep reporting applies to child abuse and neglect and to vulnerable adult abuse and neglect. Um, but when you're talking about competent adults, uh, signs or symptoms of, of injuries caused by violence, that's a safe, if this person isn't safe to accept help for whatever reason, we have this safety net of mandated reporting to try to get the, the abuser away from this person. Um, and, and these safety nets should come into place after talking to our patients about, about what they want, what they're concerned about, and what they feel is safe. Okay, so incorporate trauma-informed practices into normal patient care and client services. What is a trauma-informed approach? Again, I get this definition from the Office for Victims of Crime. It's about understanding the physical, social, and emotional impact of trauma. So the Office for Victims of Crime describes a trauma-informed approach as realizing the prevalence of trauma and the widespread impact of trauma, recognizing the signs and symptoms of trauma in patients, in visitors, and in caregivers, meaning our colleagues, our staff, um, and then responds by putting this knowledge into practice with the purpose of preventing re-traumatization. So prevalence of trauma, traumatic events are common. Most, ex most Americans experience at least one traumatic event in their lifetime, and this can be anything from experiencing or witnessing a car accident, um, uh, an act of violence, natural disaster. Um, and so keep in mind that any patient walking through the door, whether they're coming in as a crime victim or coming in for symptoms of the flu, they may be a survivor of trauma. They may have experienced a traumatic event in the last few hours or days. And the same is also true for our colleagues. Um, Trauma, traumatic events are so pervasive that anyone walking through the door can be um, experiencing effects from trauma. So what is trauma? What does that mean? The Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration frames the concept for trauma around three E's. The event, the experience of that event, and then the effects. So individual trauma results from an event or a series of events that is experienced by the person as physically or emotionally harmful or life-threatening and has lasting adverse effects. So two persons can experience the same event with different effects. So uh, an example that I like to use is a bar fight or a street riot. I know that some people may witness a bar fight and feel really excited uh, by the entertainment, while others may feel very frightened and and um, and fear for their lives. A traumatic event. Oh, you know, I'd like to take a step back and and point out um, bullying. I think bullying is another um, another experience that can be experienced differently, right? For for different people. So in my personal story, um, I had run away when I was 14 years old uh, because I was very fearful of high school. And, and this was um, the vulnerability that my trafficker capitalized on. Now, uh, I, was, I felt bullied um, in middle school, and I was so fearful of going to high school. I thought I was going to get beat up in the hallways and in the bathrooms. I mean, I can't even 
it's hard for me to even describe how overwhelmingly fearful I was about going to high school. Now, I talked to my good friend Sandy, who I grew up with. We, we experienced everything the same. I'd known her since I was two years old. And I asked her if she remembered going into high school the same way, if she remembered hearing about all the fights. And she said she didn't remember hearing about any fights except maybe one or two among people that were much, much older. She didn't feel fearful at all. A traumatic event can also have widespread impact. It can affect those who experienced it firsthand and those who witnessed or heard about the event. And of course, healthcare professionals are seeing and hearing the effects of traumatic events every day, especially in a hospital setting. This can be overwhelming and it can lead to similar feelings as the victims themselves. Vicarious trauma or secondary trauma, that means indirect exposure to a traumatic event and repeated exposure can lead to compassion fatigue and burnout. So that's a little bit about trauma. Let's talk about um, the continuum of trauma, how some events are less complex, some events are more complex. So a less complex form of trauma would be a, a single adult onset, onset incident. So think of um, a healthy, stable adult who experiences a car accident. That may be, um, the effects may be uh, less complex, right? More complex trauma would be repeated intrusive trauma, often of an interpersonal nature, often involving stigma and shame. So this would include childhood abuse in all of its form, childhood abuse and neglect, which of course includes witnessing family violence. And it includes sexual exploitation, so forms of, of violence in the community, like sexual exploitation. Complex trauma can affect a child's emotions, ability to think, learn, and concentrate. The same would be true for adults. Linked, it's linked to a range of problems, addiction, homelessness, uh, depression, anxiety, psychiatric disorders. Um, a child who cannot learn because of the environment he or she is growing up in can lead to an adult who cannot hold a job. So it's... Um, uh, trauma and complex trauma is certainly a public health issue. Persons suffering from complex trauma are not only vulnerable to trauma bonds, but they're often targeted by predators like traffickers. Victims of sex trafficking often have a long history of risk factors and traumatic events like uh, physical and sexual abuse, um, separation from family members, sexual exploitation, um, I, I published a book in 2014 called Walking Prey, in which I interviewed survivors all across the country, and I included risk factors um, that many of them shared. And it seems that most of the, of, the, of the survivors that I interviewed had at least one, if not several, of these experiences in childhood that made them vulnerable to being targeted by a predator. Uh, Re-victimization by predators results in additional trauma for victims, and especially for victims of sex trafficking, it can result in further shame, further stigma, further isolation from society. Trauma bonding. So uh, victims of many forms of interpersonal violence can develop trauma bonds with the person abusing them. So the environment necessary to create a trauma bond involves intensity, complexity, inconsistency, and a promise. Victims stay because they're holding on to the promise or the hope. So if a victim is trauma bonded uh, to their abuser, um, they may be staying because, because they're holding on to something. For domestic violence, it may be the promise that the partner is going to change, right? Because a victim likely does not want um, the relationship to end, but they want the abuse to end. For uh, victims of human trafficking, it may be the promise of a better future. So we want to refrain from judgment. Healthcare professionals can inadvertently, any professional, not just healthcare professionals, they can inadvertently re-traumatize or trigger a victim. So um, uh, um, Annika mentioned being triggered by, uh, by one of the nurses. Um, uh, th this, this is some examples to that. So key triggers include feeling a lack of control, experiencing unexpected change, feeling threatened or attacked, feeling vulnerable or frightened, and then feeling shame. 
Um, for me and my personal experience um, as a 14-year-old victim of sex trafficking, the biggest trigger for me was feeling shame. When I interacted with uh, law enforcement and healthcare professionals who were trying to help me, I the way that they talked to me um, made me feel shame. They made me feel like they thought that I had uh, chosen to run away uh, to become a prostitute. And in reality, this man convinced me to run away to become a model in Los Angeles. Victims can develop uh, these trauma triggers. Um, and again, any person can be a survivor. So it's important to observe everyone for trauma triggers, not just um, patients, but also each other, our staff, our colleagues. A trigger is any experience that re-triggers trauma in the form of flashbacks, overwhelming feelings of sadness, anxiety, um, or anger. And we have had some really intense cases of potential human trafficking victimization at Dignity Health. And um, I, we have had the experience of colleagues becoming completely overwhelmed. Um, deflated is a word that's often used because some of these cases can take a long time and a lot of energy. So it's really important that we are putting, uh, implementing a structure where we can debrief with staff and support staff and in in whatever that, the best way possible. Um, here are some examples of physical reactions that may indicate that a person is being triggered. Uh, some that are commonly associated with human trafficking is that they're easily startled by noises or unexpected touch. Um, some emotional signs or symptoms of being triggered, hyper alertness, hyper vigilance, irritability, outbursts of anger or, ra or rage. So think of Annika. She's, you know, working with the, the nurses. She often says that she, she um, was saying thank you and she was um, grateful and then she turned when this nurse said that she was going to contact her family. Um, difficulty trusting, panic, suicidal thoughts. So here's a bit of advice from another survivor. Her name is Savannah Sanders. She's the author of Sex Trafficking Prevention. Savannah says a trauma-informed approach means that you recognize that a person's behavior and choices may be influenced by trauma as opposed to assuming someone is deliberately difficult or uncooperative. So the complexity of trauma underscores the importance of victim-centered care. Again, if we're focusing on the person's needs and concerns, we can ensure a sensitive delivery of services. Um, so this is why we want to incorporate trauma-informed practices into, into normal patient care and client services. So we're offering this approach to any person walking through the door, patients and colleagues. With that, I'm going to hand it back over to Annika to finish her story and to share some additional examples of patient care. So like I said, I walked um, a mile into the hospital, and when I got to the triage, I was introduced by the triage nurse. She had said, please sit down. She wanted to take my vitals. At that point, I was walking around with gangrene infection for two weeks. My butt had actually encaved, so I wasn't able to sit down. I said, I can't sit, or said, I don't want to sit there. She said, excuse me, sit down. And I just went, shrugged my shoulders and went, okay. I sat down. When I got up, she understood because she saw the blood and infection on the feet. I wasn't trying to be uncooperative, but I wasn't really able to sit down. And then another example was when I was being trafficked, I was waterboarded, which is a form of torture. Because of the amount of surgeries I had because I was hospitalized for so long and my injuries, I, um, my esophagus had actually started to close. I was um, given oxygen masks and one time um, the physical therapist had came to the room because I was required to walk every day because I had malnutrition as well. This uh, physical therapist had took my oxygen mask off my face without telling me before that she was going to do it. When she took the oxygen mask off my face, she was just trying to put it on the, the stand to have me walk, but it scared me. I started to have a panic attack, and my vitals started to go up and down, and they went crazy. This scared me to death. My nurse came into the room, and she was able to um, deal with the situation, but we should make sure that we are making ourselves aware of things like this before we do something that could trigger our patients. There was one plastic uh, surgeon um, who I believe was in his last year of schooling. 
He was very quick paced and he was very aggressive when he worked with me. He didn't particularly care if he was putting me in physical pain because he had so many people that he had to go um, take care of on his rounds. I had a primary nurse that intervened with, with him multiple times to make sure that I was advocated for. She made me feel very cared for and he made me feel very fearful. I've seen him literally last year and I still feel very triggered by him. It's important that with victims of abuse that we're able to make sure that we ask the questions if they're comfortable around females or males. After my hospitalization, I did decide to move forward with the case. I was, like Holly had said, um, intervie uh, interviewed by three different police officers. The, the right police officer had created a relationship with me for five weeks before I decided to give my statement. I waited a year and eight months before I went to trial, which was in March 2016, and he was uh, sentenced in May, 2000, uh, May 2016. He was sentenced to life without the possibility of parole, and he was charged with sex trafficking, first-degree kidnapping, assault with use of deadly weapons resulting in substantial bodily harm, and a list of many others. That month, because of him being put away, I felt safe enough to start my job as an advocate in the movement of human trafficking. I started working with Dignity Health in August 2016 because of my hospital experience and I wanted to make a difference and I knew that the healthcare system has such a caring heart and can make a difference. I'm going to um, give it back to Holly after that, but it's been a great pleasure to uh, speak with you guys today. Thanks, Annika. Um, okay, so let me share uh, just a few more tips for trauma-informed care. Um, give the patient personal space. Not all victims find comfort in being touched, so you may want to ask permission to hold the person's hand. Um, be conscious of cultural considerations, uh, but don't assume that a person's submissive demeanor is due to their culture, especially if, you, if you're seeing signs or symptoms that this person may be a victim of abuse, neglect, uh, violence, or exploitation. Don't make promises that you can't keep, so you don't want to say, if you tell me what's going on right now, I can promise you safety and get you into a, 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 a residential program tonight. I mean unless you know that you can do that. I, I don't think that I could even say that I could do that for someone tonight because I don't know how many beds are available in, in the area. Um, listen to the patient. Be present. Focus on the patient, not the computer screen or the clipboard. In my, in my experience, um, I had to go through an emergency department um, and, uh, and be assessed by a psychiatrist before I could be released. And, and I had to be seen by other healthcare professionals too. And what I remember um, very much about these sessions is that the person was just looking at a clipboard. If the patient refers to their abuser as boyfriend or friend, then use these same terms. You want to meet your patient where they're at emotionally. Um, it's like Annika said, it's, it's going to take time for this person to realize what's happening to them, for them to, to recognize that this person is a potentially it may potentially take a long time for them to recognize that they're a victim of abuse. It did take a long time for me. Um, avoid statements or questions wrought with judgment, like why would you do this to yourself? Don't you want a better life? Um, if you're interested in um, uh, more information about anything I've covered, um, the citations are included in the PowerPoint so you can um, see and um, and search the resources. So here's our contact information, uh, mine and Annika's, and here's our website at Dignity Health Human Trafficking Response. Um, we are going to soon have available um, learning modules that will cover Human Trafficking 101, um, and then hopefully soon after that we'll have Human Trafficking 102 modules available. We'll also have this tool that we've developed um, to help uh, uh, someone in a hospital setting walk in and, and speak with a patient in a victim-centered and trauma-informed manner. Um, with that, I think I'll open it up for questions. Oh, I, I want to point out one more thing. Um, in the third session, we're going to have Dr. Ron Chambers, who is a physician with Dignity Health. He has a clinic um, where he's offering a, um, a medical home to survivors 
of sex and labor trafficking. So Ron is going to be able to speak to the structure of that, the model of that clinic, and um, uh, information around longitudinal care and services for survivors. Great. Thank you so much um, to our presenters. We will now begin the Q&A portion of the presentation. Um, I will ask Brandon, our operator, to give some instructions. At this time, we will open the floor for questions. If you would like to ask a question, please dial the star key, followed by the one key on your touchtone phone now. Questions will be taken in the order in which they are received. If at any time you would like to remove yourself from the questioning queue, simply dial star 2. Again, to ask a question, for those of you attending via the phone, please dial star 1. You may also ask your questions via the chat pod located to the right-hand side of your screen. Great. Thank you. Um, while people are um, thinking about questions, we do have one um, earlier. Ruthie asked, I work in an emergency department. Would you recommend any particular resource as a comprehensive educational source? Well, I, I did recommend earlier um, the AHA has the webinar for the first presentation, um, Human Trafficking 101, which covers um, definitions of sex and labor trafficking and prevalence and some common indicators. Uh, my co-presenter, Philip Brown, is a, an emergency department director, so he was able to share a little bit about um, uh, uh, dynamics of some of the cases that he's seen in his emergency department. Um, but additional resources, um, if, you, if you mean a, a resource to share with um, a patient when you're trying to describe human trafficking, um, there is this one resource available from the FBI. Um, it's a brochure uh, where the audience is a potential victim and it's describing um, what human trafficking is, and um, and I'll I'll post that up here shortly. There you go. Great, thank you. Uh, Jennifer asks, where can we access the learning modules you mentioned and the assessment tool when available? We're hoping that they're going to be available very soon. I don't have a, a timeline at this moment, but um, we uh, do have a team at Dignity Health actively working to make the 101 module available um, on our web page, and then we have this internal uh, resource. Um, it's a one-page tool that isn't necessarily about uh, assessing a, a victim. Um, it's more about educating the patient about um, various forms of, of violence, including human trafficking, and, um, and then sort of describing an, an approach uh, to ask about safety concerns, particularly if you're seeing that this person is presenting with risk factors uh, or indicators. And, um, and again, we, we hope to have that tool available very soon. So um, keep an eye on our, on our webpage. Currently on our webpage, we do have a 50-page um, shared learnings manual that you can download for free that describes our program in detail, um, what we've done so far. But I am hoping to uh, have a new one available very soon that describes um, kind of what we're doing now, because we have learned a lot over the last year. And yes, the question is, can you access those resources? That, you can access those resources here, dignityhealth.org, human trafficking response. Well, great. Thank you so much. I don't think we have any questions from the um, from the audio lines, and um, so I just want to thank the presenters. This has been a powerful and very informative session. Uh, we are really looking forward to the next webinar on February twenty uh, second with Dr. Ron Chambers. And with that, I would like to thank you all for attending, and hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Um, and this uh, concludes our webinar today. Thank you so much. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. This concludes today's conference. You may now disconnect your lines, log off the webinar. Have a great afternoon. Thank you.